this is a little bit an expansion of the work I've done, especially um, primarily with Melissa. But we all are dealing with a really a, a new challenge, and especially those of us working um, in neurodevelopmental disorders and those you know challenged by neurodevelopmental disorders. But what I really wanted to talk about was marrying the two areas that we're working in, which is what happens during um, gestation that may change the way the brain develops and this real time event we have of maternal immune activation or infection during pregnancy or the potential for infection during pregnancy or the stress of dealing with the COVID-19 situation. So really I'm, I'm presenting probably less data than I normally would, but talking about what we're doing, how we're addressing things, what our plans are, what our challenges have been in, in doing this work. And um, I've left a great deal of time for questions because I think this is a, an area that invites a lot of discussion, hopefully, and some interest. So with that, now today's presentation, I could not have done the work that I'm going to present without my collaboration with Dr. Lisa Crone. She's at Kaiser Permanente Division of Research. She's an epidemiologist, and much of the work and the projects that I'm going to be presenting are work that I did in conjunction with Lisa, and we have an ongoing collaboration. We've been working together for 21 years now. And I think I, I sort of start with this because when I, especially when I'm speaking to a broader audience, is this thinking about the health of your immune system during pregnancy is something that probably, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't think a lot about. But now we know that this can change the way your child's brain develops. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And what if we could predict, knowing this information, which child might be affected by altered neurodevelopment or in, and leading to a neurodevelopmental disorder. And I use this term broadly because it's not just autism or schizophrenia. It's really in speaking about how the, the brain changes during development based on what might happen during pregnancy. So to give you a teeny bit of background in is understanding the role of the maternal immune system as during gestation and how does a woman's response to infection during pregnancy increase the risk of having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder? And I think there's a lot of caveats to this, and, and, and I will go through that, but just a quick background. I think no, it's an interesting time to be an immunologist because I don't think any at any time in, in my career have I, so many people understood what I do because the media and cytokines and cytokine storm and those those terms have been put out there you know by our response to COVID and how some people go into the more severe COVID response and, and the long-term COVID effects and really what they are are these just tiny molecules that tell other immune cells what to do, like when to become activated, when to reduce activity, because there are up and down regulators in the cytokines. Chemokines are the molecules that tell cells where to go, where to migrate, where there's a site of infection, how to get there, and they follow that, that chemical trail to get there. So these tiny little molecules of sort of, they protect us, they, they keep our, our um, system healthy, but when they get a little bit out of control, we end up with um, some of the more severe uh, responses, say, to COVID and, the, and that sort of lung inflammation that we see or autoimmune, autoimmunity, autoimmune diseases. So um, that's just a tiny bit of background. But I think one of example of this is what we see in sort of what we see in the brain and what we see in the um, periphery, in the immune environment, that these cytokines, okay, these are so IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, IL-6 are the classical pro-inflammatory cytokines um, that are upregulated when you be become infected with an infectious agent. And these, these are your pro-inflammatory pro pathways, but they also are responsible for sleep, fever induction, and in, in certain cases, neurotoxicity. And so these are, the, these are the cytokines that when you feel sick, that you don't, you just want to sleep, you've got the fever, you just, you don't want to be around anybody. That's actually the reaction of your brain to an upregulation of these cytokines. And, and when these cytokines are hit certain parts of the brain, the chemokines, which we know are important, as I said, for trafficking of cells to a site of infection, are also critical for, for neuro, you know, neuron migration, neuromodulation, 
and, and certain functions going on in the brain. And these things, because these are not just found in the immune system, as I'll show you in a minute, they actually are super important in getting cells where they need to go during healthy brain development. And then TGF beta is an anti-inflammatory cytokine growth factor that actually impacts almost all aspects of neurodevelopment. Also keeping in mind, these need to be in sort of in that correct balance, very much the Goldilocks um, phenomenon. IL-6, for example, too little IL-6 is actually damaging as well. So it's, it's that sweet spot that we need um, that regulatory balance. As I said, balance, whether you're while immunization or infection may cause an increase in activation of the immune response, there are many things that actually affect how strong that response is, how well you respond. And some of that is your repertoire. What, what sort of, what combination of factors do you have, you know, in your immune system? And your hormonal status may also alter immune regulation. So this may be why some people are resilient to the effects of infection during pregnancy, meaning they, they don't have any long-term um, impact, oops, or why and why others are not. So an example for COVID-19 and inflammation. So these cytokine um, growth factors and chemokines that pr promote the onset and progression of, of inflammation, which you need to fight infection, when this becomes what we say dysregulated or, or lacks regulation, can um, overwhelm the system. And it's this balance between this healthy homeostasis and a disease state. Now, for most of us, this is a short-lived transient time and, and, it, and it goes back to balance once we've resolved the infection. The problem happens when either, when this doesn't happen or you respond really strongly to something. And, and so there are risk factors such as um, age and genetics, which you cannot help, right? You are the age you are and you have the genes you have. And there are modifiable ones such as smoking, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, obesity, um, metabolic syndrome, which we also know um, both are um, risk factors for severe COVID, but also are risk factors for altering neurodevelopment. So this is a lot of the work that I'm doing in this impact study that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So this is the model, right? We've got an infectious, um, an infection in the mother during pregnancy. As I said, it upregulates IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, which also are, are speak, talking to the HPA axis in the mom for that fever response that we see. And some of these actually transfer, they, impact, they may impact the placenta directly, but they also transfer across the placenta and can enter into the um, fetal compartment. And what we think happens at the, is that this may alter CMS development in some. So you have the infection, which is a fever response. And, and many of the studies that have looked at this over time, and the early studies actually started in schizophrenia, are talking about really you have to hit that level of fever, right? And then impaired immune regulation, meaning the reduced ability to control this inflammation, that it, it, it stays at a, at a higher state than it should once you've resolved the infection. And then increased inflammatory cytokine production. As I said, you're, you've got that high level of inflammation when you should have be done regulating. And one of the things about pregnancy that we do know is that it is a regulated immune state because you don't want to reject your fetus. And so the immune system has changed dramatically during pregnancy until it gets to birth, which is an inflammatory process. And you're now rejecting that fetus or giving birth. So the immune and nervous system interface is, is complicated. And we used to think that there, this barrier was completely, this blood brain barrier was completely impervious to any immune molecules from the periphery getting into the central nervous system and that there was no, you know, that the neurons did not make cytokines. We didn't, we just didn't know a lot. And now we know that this is a very open communication with the exception of antibodies, which really do not cross um, into the system unless there has been a perturbation of the blood-brain barrier. But we also know that we have cytokine um, receptors on, on the immune cells, but they also are on cells in the nervous system. So this crosstalk is really important, we now know, for both um, development of the brain, but also a homeostasis in a healthy brain throughout the lifespan. So immune signaling molecules 
play critical roles, as I said, in all stages of fetal brain development. And the other thing to remember is these systems are developing together. So they are co-developing. The immune system is co-developing along with the, the nervous system. And that changes in this maternal fetal environment, immune environment can disrupt this very finely orchestrated event. And that there, while there is certainly some um, cushion, right, for error in there, it's when it becomes, just goes on too long or becomes so heightened that it impact, that it puts the system out of balance that we have concerns. So there is a lot of epidemiologic as evidence um, for when we perturb the maternal immune environment during gestation that we ha maybe have a negative impact on neurodevelopment. Maternal stress is certainly one that not only affects, that, that affects a whole host of systems. And I think now that is particularly pertinent, and I'll talk about a study that we've designed to actually look at this. Autoimmunity is, is a state of inflammation that's not resolved and, and has put you into an autoimmune response. Um, I, and so this is, um, this is certainly my area of, of um, interest and in, in what I've been working in my entire career, but it is, um, and we're looking at family history of these conditions because that may be the genetic piece that we think about where you, the lack of immune re regulation. In utero infection, so there are infections that we get that can actually transmit into the fetal compartment, but many of what we're talking about are actually infection that you have during pregnancy that doesn't necessarily directly affect the fetal compartment like Zika virus, but that just puts the maternal system out of balance. And then present, you know, sort of the, um, what can we do preventatively? What can we do to mitigate some of these, these impacts? So the majority of women, um, as I said, are exposed to immune challenges during pregnancy, right? We get colds more frequently, first of all, because our immune system is ramped down, so we don't reject the fetus, as I said. And there are lots of things that we can't take anything for them. And, and so the majority of people are exposed to this. It's really not the, if I get an infection, I will have a child with an issue. It will change the way. That is not the case. As I said, there's many factors, and, and we're trying to understand those factors, genetic susceptibility, the timing of that exposure, the intensity of the response to that exposure, which is key, and even potentially additional postnatal events. So these are all things that we take into consideration as we think about um, what we call these maternal immune activation sort of stressors. So one of the studies that I was involved in with Lisa, we called the Early Markers for Autism Study, or EMA. And this was really designed, it was a very large prenatal study. It was designed to investigate early biologic markers. Could we come up with any markers of susceptibility um, that predisposed toward autism or developmental delay without autism? Exposure and exposure from critical periods of, of brain development. So the samples were taken during the second trimester. We, deter, we were looking at the etiologic contribution or sort of, you know, the causal contribution from these immunologic factors as well as genetic susceptibility factors, environmental exposures, and the interplay of, of genes with environment. So how these were all um, interfacing to potentially change how development occurred. So this was a very large population-based um, case control study. So we had mother-baby pairs and we, did this um, in two phases, actually. We had a smaller study, as you can see by the numbers, the phase one study, um, but the design was the same. And then we ramped it up. We had some interesting data from the first set and we, we were able to collect more and, and got a grant to continue this work to and so where we were up to about 400 um, samples in each um, population set. So this was, the prospective collection of maternal second trimester blood, as I said, but we also got newborn peripheral blood. And so we got the blood spots that when they do the heel sticks when the babies are born and we, we got those and we can loot out of those um, samples so that we can test that as well. I'm not gonna talk about those studies today, but um, we do have um, several studies that we've done on this population. So these are sort of the, the prenatal exposure to the organochlorines, hazardous air pollution, the um, flame retardants and, and uh, PFCs are sort of the pollutants that we were looking at. 
we did a genome-wide um, SNP analysis and, and um, looked for CNVs between uh, um, looking um, between the mom and child because we had the maternal blood and we had the child uh, newborn blood spot. We could do that. We did cytokines and chemokines. Um, C-reactive protein, immunoglobulins, and autoantibodies in both in the mother and then um, much of this in the babies in the newborn blood spot. And then we had behavioral data, we had de their developmental um, data, and then we had medical um, information from this population. So we put all these data together, and I'm really going to just talk about the um, work that we did here in my lab, which was the maternal prenatal cytokines. And this study compared mothers of children with autism with no intellectual disability, um, because we had those data. We had autism with intellectual disability. We had children with developmental delay that did not have a diagnosis of autism. And then we had general population controls. And the controls in this study were simply people that never sought services in the state of California. So they aren't, we couldn't certify that they were um, typically developing or neurotypical, that they didn't have autism or they didn't have developmental delay, all we know is that they never went to a regional center to get services. And this is a very complicated table that I'm going to walk through just a little bit. Um, these are, so this is what we did. These are all the, the factors that we did, the growth factors that we did. Uh, and innate inflammatory cytokines that come from the your first line defense. We did the TH1 cytokines, which are the inflammatory cytokines of your adaptive immune system. Um, the TH2 cytokines are the ones that are we are have a little more regulatory, but also promote antibody production. The TH17 cytokine, which is um, very definitely inflammatory and has had a lot of um, exposure um, in terms of the maternal act, immune activation animal models. And then the innate inflammatory chemokines, so the, the cells that are those signaling molecules that tell cells where to go. And so one of the things that we noticed, and I think this is the first time we've really had the sample set to be able to do this, was that mothers of children with autism and intellectual disability had elevated inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And that was when we, we um, compared them to the um, general population controls but it also separated them from those who had developmental delay without autism. And especially interesting for us was the autism with intellectual de developmental disability group was separated from those without intellectual disability. And this was the first really big study we could subphenotype based on the maternal cytokine and chemokine profile. And it also suggests a lack of selective immune regulation because you've got some elevation here in these because they're trying to overcome um, but really our biggest um, factors that we saw were those inflammatory um, cytokines and chemokines so this was sort of this is kind of what set us you know on the journey in the in our clinical studies not not necessarily our animal studies but we needed a larger more interdisciplinary pregnancy study to, that addressed the importance of inflammation in altered neurodevelopment more globally. So this, um, Lisa and I came up with the our immune metabolic markers during pregnancy and child development or impact study. And this is our largest study to date. Um, this to characterize the maternal immune and metabolic profiles during pregnancy. So one thing I think that is important to remember that metabolic syndrome is actually an inflammatory event. It is something that you have a generation of, of um, elevated inflammatory molecules along with just even if you did not have any kind of um, uh, infectious event. So, but it's also, it's also a, a sustained um, inflammatory event. So we were looking at, we were looking at the um, longitudinal patterns associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes in the offspring, meaning we're testing samples over pregnancy. So we have two samples during, taken during pregnancy. And we're looking at, and then this, this is an important part of this study, is the uh, maternal factors that are driving if we see changes, right? The demographic, where do they live? What is, what is their demographic profile? What, you know, sort of race, ethnicity, background, educational background, the, all of the clinical characteristics we have, because this is the beauty of working with Kaiser, you have all of the clinical um, information available to you, as well as we've got um, uh, 
a geneticist at UCSF working with us. Um, so this, and so we're looking at this in association with altered maternal immune or metabolic function or together uh, during pregnancy and the risk of different neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we have not limited this to autism. We're looking at developmental delay without autism. We're looking at cerebral palsy, which we know is uh, increased um, when you have especially a really um, acute, strong inflammatory event prior to birth. So there's a, there are many um, aspects of this that we're looking at. And it's, again, a case control study. And the kids that we're looking at were born uh, 2011 to 2015. So this is the Kaiser birth cohort. So this study, as I said, we have a number of um, sort of central to this are the immune profile of the mom during pregnancy and the metabolic profile as well as mater several maternal characteristics. Were they sick during pregnancy? Their demographic, did they have uh, infections? So we get the mother and child medical records. We also have a pregnancy survey that we're doing um, as part of this. And then we have um, the maternal genetic profile. And as I said, a host of different neurodevelopmental disorders. And we're taking the samples during the first and second trimester. So. That sort of brought us, we had the study built, we, it was ongoing, we were doing everything, and then COVID hit. And we thought, well, what can we do during this time? It's an opportunity that we'll never have, hopefully again, I hope, <coughs> excuse me, I hope not, that what can we learn about the effects of maternal infection in real time and neurodevelopment during this pandemic? How, how do we address this? And I think, um, as I said, what we know is maternal infection and fever increase the susceptibility. They don't cause necessarily, but they can increase the susceptibility of offspring to several neurodevelopmental disorders, including schizophrenia and autism. And I think some of that depends on timing. And maternal in inflammation during pregnancy can result from immune dysregulation due to infection or stress. Stress has a, is a big player, can be a big player here. And that's something that we're taking into consideration. And that COVID-19, pandemic may therefore result in increased maternal inflammation during pregnancy. We may have some real-time data. We don't yet know what the direct effect of, of viral infection, although it doesn't look like it does get into the fetal compartment um, like we see with Zika. And then children born to women of lower socioeconomic status, Black or Hispanic, and women with pre-existing chronic health conditions are known to exacerbate COVID-19 infection. And I think some of that is, is due to care, you know, access to care, and some of it is due to genetics, but um, these are, they're going to be at higher risk for having issues with COVID. So we established the impact COVID-19 study. We have a, 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 a um, administrative supplement, which means that we built upon our original impact study. And this is to establish a new pregnancy cohort to investigate the impact of COVID-19 on child neurodevelopment. So where the other study ended at 2015, this picked up in, in current. And so we're now we're following women in real time. And the hypothesis is, so what we're thinking is that maternal COVID-19 infection and or pandemic related stress, I think mean, this is also really important, during pregnancy will increase the risk of ASD and other neurodevelopmental disorders in children via the in utero exposure to the heightened maternal inflammation during pregnancy. And so I think this, you know, this study was designed, we have um, the cohort we can follow is about 45,000 pregnancies. We have the e, uh, electronic health records collected for all mothers and children. So we we're so there's, the, that's the epi part of this study. We also, um, uh, Lisa's team created an online survey. The goal was 20,000. That's what we were hoping to get. We've gotten over 20,000 completed to date and it's still ongoing. So I think there's a lot of people that are super, um, they're, they're really interested in participating in this. And I think it gives them an outlet, you know, to, to be doing something during a time when everything was really restricted. And especially when you're, if you have any, um, you know, sort of information that you've got, you know, it's sort of we know, I mean, or this research has become really well known about the infection during pregnancy. And if you're worried about that, um, then you are really um, interested in participating. And then we have self-reported infection, exposure to COVID, um, symptoms that they had during um, that time, stress, as I said, which was a huge part, depression, 
anxiety, uh, impact the impact that has had on employment, food security, um, and behaviors during pregnancy, and then healthcare and healthcare access. So these are all the components of that, and um, we're working on um, digesting the data from this right now. The other thing that Kaiser added was that they are doing um, the um, COVE-2 uh, viral PCR testing is done on all mothers at admission for delivery. So now we will have actual infection data on that and um, we will have whether they were infected at the time of delivery or not. We also are collecting, getting um, the newborn blood spots. We only had funding for this um, because we have two years left in the grant. We only had funding to be able to do 550 of those, but we, are, we will be looking for the cytokine, chemokine profiles in those. And we're also looking for COVID-19 antibodies, both IgM and IgG. So IgM tells us there was an infection at some time and it's resolved IgM. If we are finding IgM, that means it's very recent. Um, so I think, you know, this is how the study was de designed. Um, and so among women known to have COVID-19 infection during pregnancy, we're going to examine the relationship between the levels of these antibodies in um, neonatal blood and or developmental disorders in the first two years of life. So that's that's the length of the grant. We're working on writing another proposal to be able to extend this and to get samples from the mother during pregnancy. But the hypothesis is that infection, this is, you know, COVID, oh, sorry. COVID infection during pregnancy will result in COVID-19 antibodies. We should be able to measure those in neonatal blood. The IgG that we find in blood is from the mother, not from the, from the fetus, because they, uh, it goes across the placenta during pregnancy to protect the child. And that the risk of child neurodevelopmental disorders will, will correlate with these antibody levels and will be increased, especially if IgM antibodies are generated, because that also means that the child um, has had exposure or has a very recent exposure. And then the relationship between antibody levels and neurodevelopmental disorder risk will be modified by the timing during pregnancy. So when does this occur? And any maternal comorbidities or health conditions such as, as obesity, asthma, and other um, maternal factors, as well as the child sex. So um, among the women with known COVID-19 infection during pregnancy, and I think we are at about 3.2% 3, 3 average um, of women that, we've, that we have come into the study so far that have had COVID-19. We will examine the neonatal cytokine and chemokine profiles, which gives us the two things. One is some of that is from the mother. So what, what was um, upregulated because of the maternal immune um, response and then what the child is producing and and um, for example in a study um, that we did with Yvonne Wu at UCSF the levels of IL-6 in um, newborn blood spots from children who went on to develop cerebral palsy were very high and and this some of which came from the mother but there also is the potential that they were stimulated very early to produce their own IL-6 and our hypothesis here is that COVID-19 infection during pregnancy will alter the phenotype of the newborn, so the neurodevelopmental outcome, and <clears throat> as well as the immune profile. And that this altered cytokine chemokine profile, and we have some of this comes from our prior work, will predict neurodevelopmental disorder risk. Um, so we know the relationship between the cytokine and chemokine profile and NDD risk will be modified by the timing, again, during pregnancy of the maternal infection and that her um, comorbid health conditions. So what are we seeing so far? And I think, you know, this is where it's very early because we just got this funded not very long ago. We, as, as we anticipate, sadly, we are seeing disparities in the rates of COVID-19 infection during pregnancy across demographic and clinical characteristics. Unfortunately, it's and then this is sort of the greater Oakland area, so it's it's an, um, that's where the sample base is. The highest in African American population, Latina and Asian women. Um, highest in women under 25, which I thought was interesting. Um, highest in women living in neighborhoods with high deprivation, which sadly is also not a big surprise. But again, highest in women with pre-existing asthma, allergies, and obesity. So. Um, this infection rate that we're seeing 
there's no great surprises here, um, unfortunately, but um, at least, you know, it helps us understand what these factors might bring. So that is where we are on that study. And, and I thought um, I would spend some of the remainder of my time talking about, because these are questions I get asked as an, as an immunologist. Um, I've been asked by several um, of my colleagues actually, about what about what do we do about vaccination during pregnancy? Now we're in a time where we have a vaccine. There's a lot of hope on the horizon that we'll be able to be protected, depending on you know what um, vaccine tier group you fall into. But you know what do we what about during pregnancy? Um, so you know one of the things these are the just sort of what we know. For these are the studies that have come out um, um, that I'm going to talk about. But we know that. Pregnant women with severe critical COVID-19 infection are at increased risk for preterm birth and pregnancy loss. We also know that in studies of um, women who are hospitalized for COVID-19, the risk for preterm delivery has ranged from um, 10 to 25%, which is pretty high, with as high as 60% uh, among women with critical um, COVID illness. So the primary risk of pregnancy appears to be from the maternal illness and how she's dealing with COVID infection. And in addition, pregnant women may be at higher risk for severe illness and death caused by COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant women because you're very compromised, as I said, immunologically during pregnancy, but you also have a great stressor because you're pregnant, right? A physiologic stressor. So in an analysis, so this is some work that was just published in JAMA, um, the national surveillance data included uh, pregnancy status of 400,000 women with symptomatic COVID illness through October. So right before we, it got really bad, the adjusted risk ratio in women versus those of similar age that are not pregnant is three times, you're three times higher, more likely to end up in the intensive care unit, um, 2.9, so almost three times higher to require mechanical ventilation or, um, um, and to be placed on a ventilator and 1.7 times higher for death related to the to COVID-19. So thus, and this is an, you know, this is why we're discussing this is preventing critical COVID infection is important for both the mother and the fetus. And, and I think um, you know, there's a lot out there about vaccines during, you know, what do we do about vaccines and neurodevelopmental disorders, vaccines during pregnancy, but this particular vaccine. Um, and for those of us who have had it, we know what it feels like to have it, but um, it is very immunogenic. It creates a very strong immune response, which is what you want to be protected. That's why it's so highly protective versus some of like, say the flu vaccine, which is about half as protective, but it's not infectious. It doesn't integrate into your system. It doesn't integrate in your cells. You're not gonna get any virus. Um, they do have potential benefits over the live attenuated, the inactivated or subunit vaccines because they elicit such a complete and, and um, well-rounded and, and um, effective immune response. There's no risk of acquiring infection from the vaccine at all. There's no infectious components in there at all. There's no adjuvant because this is not a vaccine um, that requires an adjuvant because it, 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 it is its own adjuvant and its packaging in the way it stimulates the response. And while no specific studies have evaluated, you know, the ability of this lipid nanoparticle vaccine to reach the fetus during vaccination, it's highly unlikely that this is gonna happen because it's gonna get caught up in the cells that take it up. It'll limit its, trans, um, its um, localization to the muscle cells and to the immune cells that are gonna take it up. They'll see this as a danger signal, they will take it up and they will um, process it and present it which is why, you know, making that response. And, and the CDC's current position on this, and I think they've had to go back and forth a little bit because there just aren't data. They didn't test the vaccines in pregnant women um, for the obvious reason, but um, that as part of the, and they did, they are starting to collect data because some women who were um, immunized didn't realize they were pregnant at the time. So they, they are collecting data on that. But um, you know, as clinic, clinicians should acknowledge, there's empathy for this, right? <clears throat> we do have limited available evidence, especially given the tensions over vaccine anyway and, and neurodevelopmental outcome. But I think one of the biggest things um, to take into account is what is your risk of exposure during pregnancy, right? If you're at home and your risk is very low, then 
it may not be an issue, right? You just, you write out, you know, you, you go on with your pregnancy and, and then um, as things change, you get your vaccine later. Um, but if you're in necessary, you know, frequent necessary contact with others, you don't have the ability to sequester um, during t your occupation or other reasons, um, then they do recommend that you get the vaccine. Now, there's a whole host of different vaccines that are coming up. On Friday, they expect to have Pfizer's vaccine um, uh, um, through the um, FDA approved for the emergency use. So um, there may be other types of vaccines that might um, be recommended, but I think we're just in this place of, this is what we know, this is where we are right now. But what we do know, and this is sort of in summary, is that maternal immune activation and inflammation, you know, profound inflammation during these critical periods of gestation can increase the likelihood of having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So this is a very real, um, you know, concern. But as I said, not everyone who gets an infection will go on to have a child with autism. We just are still working out the markers of which women, um, you know, who might be of increased likelihood. This is not necessarily specific to the agent, as I said, as, as is the case with Zika virus, but rather how the woman responds immunologically. Now, that's not to say that the response to Zika doesn't also contribute, but Zika virus does have the ability to go in and, and directly impact uh, development of the brain. Not all women that have an infection, as I said, with fever will have a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So um, as, as I say, we are, this is why we do the research that we're doing and we're trying to work as fast as we can, but we use our animal models, the work we're doing in our um, mouse, rat, and monkey models with Mia, maternal immune activation. All of these things are, to, we're trying to provide evidence and try to understand what those risk factors are. So I think this is, you know, this is where we are. I have a, a great team of people that I work with, um, Lisa Crohn, and then my team that we have here at UC Davis, um, my students in my lab, and some of the clinicians. And I think um, we're sort of at a place where we can say that we've got, you know, the potential for understanding this a little better. And we're, we will take every advantage that we can to try to get answers as quickly as we can. We're working during a pandemic, which has certainly hampered our ability to do the job that we're doing here, but we've, we're making the best of it. Um, we're, we're being very creative right now, but I think, um, Hopefully in the next year, we will come out with some more answers on this, at least on this particular pandemic question. Thank you so much, Judy. Virtual round of applause for that uh, presentation and such an important topic and so many questions we don't know. I really um, appreciate your efforts and you, you highlight how much we don't know about the maternal fetal immune environment. And I think you and I are both very um, excited about our ability to fill in those gaps and provide some data-driven um, healthcare evidence going forward. Uh, we'd like to open up the remainder of our time um, uh, to questions. We have a, a number of attendees. If you have a question, please type it into the question answer box. We don't have the chat box up, so you need, you need to use the Q&A box. Um, Judy and I will just go back and forth uh, monitoring those questions. Judy, there is there is a, an initial question that came through, and this question relates to the use of over-the-counter medications, and in particular, the use of over-the-counter medications post-COVID vaccine. And before I turn that over to you, I will, of course, uh, give the, the preface that uh, Dr. Vandewater and I are uh, not physicians, so we, we certainly <laughs> recommend that you follow up with your healthcare provider. But I thought, um, Judy, you could maybe speak more broadly to the relationships between cytokines and fever and over-the-counter med medication, and also the difference between the maternal immune response to a naturally occurring pathogen like a virus versus an immunization. So maybe you could touch on some of those questions. Uh, sure. No, I'm happy to. And I think, uh, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, that question is, is um, it's an excellent question. I think there are two parts to that. One is if you are not pregnant and you're getting a vaccine, you know, our, our, our sort of as an immunologist, I would recommend toughing it out as long as you can before you take any fever reducing medication, because that fever tells you your vaccination is working. I mean, that that is 
you know, that means your immune response is doing what it's supposed to do. It is, it can be uncomfortable. I mean, if it gets above 101, then I would say yes. But, um, it, and, you know, I think um, it, it, it's, we sort of are bridging that between discomfort and actually having it, and it's short lived. I mean, we've, I, I know I've been through it. I mean, my fever got to 101 and um, with the Moderna, and was it comfortable? Not super comfortable, but I took as little as I could just so that I could sleep. And then eight hours later was gone and that was it. That is one of the differences between a vaccine and, a, and a, an infection, right? That is a super transient. It is a tiny blip. It is not going to have that lasting impact that the, and especially you could have a fever for 10 days with COVID, right? If you have a serious COVID infection, that go on for 10 days. And that is something that I would definitely not recommend um, putting up with if you're pregnant. And so now that brings us to the, what do you take um, to reduce that? Again, that is something that if it happens, you discuss that with your physician, right? Um, you know, there are, um, Tylenol has been, you know, sort of like if you have to take Tylenol during pregnancy, you know, that has been deemed not so bad. Um, not trying to, you know, do the um, anti-inflammatories like um, Advil, but I think that is a tricky and a very an excellent question, and um, I'm not medically qualified to answer that question. But I think that is, you know, the the impact of having a severe fever during pregnancy is going to be like I would be in there in a heartbeat asking my physician for, you know, guidance on that one. Thank you, Judy. And we'll we'll give it a second to see if there are more questions coming in through the chat room. Um, while we're waiting, I'll ask a, a follow up. I know, and you you spoke uh, about this during the presentation. But one of the major challenges that we have is understanding how much is too much in terms of the maternal cytokine response, um, and we just don't know yet. So that's that's our our bottom line. But um, can you speak a little bit about um, individual variability? So how we have such different responses to the same pathogen um, and how we can leverage some of that variability to better understand the prenatal immune challenge risk. Right. And, you know, I mean, that is uh, certainly true. We certainly do not all react the same way. Um, nor for the same duration, right? And and some of that is your repertoire of your the army that you've got of, of immune factors at your disposal. But also, um, you know, I think as you said, we don't know what's that threshold, right? And and that's kind of how I think about it. What's that threshold? I think not just how high it gets, but how long it stays that way. Uh, and that's what we're trying to use our animal models to understand. Also, um, you know. If you get, we're sort of, you know, the work we're doing through the Connie Center, do you hit this sort of, um, as you hit this threshold, does it, um, you know, how does that predispose you? And and it's exciting to be part of that research. I know it's frustrating for people out there because we're not doing it very quickly, but we just, this is sort of a newish area, actually. This has not been something that people have even thought about for, um, you know, a long time. Absolutely. I think there's a growing consensus that we don't understand as much as we need to about the maternal fetal immune environment and the impact on the, the developing brain. So it's, it's an exciting area of research and we both certainly feel the, the need to move as quickly as possible. Judy, there's a, a question in the chat room. My son is five years old and on the spectrum. My questions are, are cytokines involved in ASD without intellectual disability? And knowing ASD is more frequent in males, is there a core correlation with the immune response. So, so probably a more general um, update on uh, immune development within autism spectrum. Oh, that is a very huge question. Um, so, you know, the work I presented was um, really kind of more about um, what we think, you know, in large terms. And when we haven't honed in on a lot at this point, you know, down into sort of the details, but we do know that, um, you know, kids, yes, there, there are cytokines, chemokines that are involved without intellectual disability during pregnancy in the mom. We also, my colleague at the Institute, Paul Ashwood, and I have worked a long time on what, the, what is going on in the kids and their immune dysregulation and how that impacts um, 
both their autism, but also their um, phenotype of autism, especially GI disorders, you know, sort of um, having, you know, sort of those other things going along with that. But um, is there a correlation with the immune response in terms of maternal? We think so. In terms of the child, we also think so. But again, that is work that's ongoing and it, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. And given some of that is due to what Melissa talked about, which is that variability we see in humans. We, we respond very variably. Uh, you know, none of us makes the same response. And so that when you're working in a not, you know, in mice, it's so easy because they're genetically sort of genetically identical, right? But they are really similar to each other. And when we work in the clinical samples, is it's a whole nother story. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have more, um, more that I can respond to on that. And a lot of that is just because it's something that, you know, we're, we're constantly working on. Okay, thanks, Judy. Um, we have another question in the the chat, and this this relates to um, seasonality. So the question is, in a bigger picture, um, they're curious about the effects of seasonality and that how that might um, interact with an increased risk of maternal infection and subsequent likelihood of neurodevelopmental disorders. And I know this is a mixed literature, but I'll let you take a first pass at the the seasonality Actually, yeah, question. You, you go for that one. Go ahead. It's a mixed <laughs> literature, so it is. Initially, some of, some of the evidence linking schizophrenia um, with maternal affection came from studies where they observed a seasonal um, component. Uh, those studies are really challenging to do, especially for schizophrenia, because at that time you were asking women to reflect back on pregnancies that had occurred you know, 15, 20 years ago after their, their child had ultimately been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, but that was, that was one of our first hints that there may be something, there may be an interaction between the maternal immune response and uh, changes in fetal development. So much more that we need to work on. I know there's also interest in um, other factors that lead to an inflammatory response. In California, we talk about wildfires and the, the air pollution issues. So um, lots more research to be done. Judy, anything you want to add? Yeah, and I think, you know, the other seasonality factor are um, the asthma allergy component, right? Seasonal allergies, especially if you live here in this valley, you can, it can be, you know, extremely um, <laughs> bad for some people. And that sort of, um, that, that actually is another seasonal um, exposure that we talk about. And then when David does those, they go down to the, <laughs> to go back into the answer. Um, and uh, extreme weather, um, you know, Paul, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, one of the issues is um, these, events that we're having, you know, like the wildfire, you know, these are kind of stressful events besides being impactful in terms of um, what's in the air, what you're breathing. And I think that that actually is something that we're going to tack on to our impact study um, as well. And um, given where we live here and where the, the population lives, but um, you can imagine being pregnant in Texas right now, you've got no power, or, you know, re recently you had no power for seven days. Those, and hurricane stress, uh, that, that has been a huge link into altered neurodevelopment, right? Living through these severe weather um, events like hurricane, you know, tornado, the, the big freeze that they just had. Um, so yes, that is very valid and definitely something that has been linked. Okay, thanks, Judy. Um, another question related to the COVID vaccine. Do you think the varied reactions to the vaccine mimic the range of symptoms that would have occurred with the COVID-19 infection, i.e. are people who had minimal immune response the same ones who would have had asymptomatic, asymptomatic COVID-19 infections? That is an awesome question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, in, in um, just looking up stuff for my COVID um, research here, one of the things that um, came up was um, people who went on to get COVID sequelae, right, you know, sort of the symptoms of severe symptoms of COVID versus people who didn't and looking at those that had made an antibody response. So these are not people that, these are people that were positive, were tested, had antibodies to the, to the infectious agent, but at the cellular level, so their T cell and monocyte macrophage probably was very different 
that those um, than the people who had severe disease. So I think, you know, there may be something to that, that it's not that you're not protected, they're, they're making antibodies, but how you deal with it at the cellular level and how, you know, sort of that level of, of both cytokine, chemokine, but the cells that expand when you have that exposure are what are driving, potentially driving those differences between symptomatic and asymptomatic, even though you both may be protected. I, believe me, there's a lot of work going into this, you know, still, because we don't have the answers. I mean, I, I, this is, I mean, it's kind of an exciting time to be a researcher, right? We're doing, everything is in real time, frustrating at the same time, because you don't have the answers already, but um, it is kind of a, a nice time to be doing this. Um, we have another question that came in through email, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway. Uh, a woman writes in who has an 18-year-old daughter with Rett syndrome, and she's scheduled, oh, she gets the vaccine, the flu vaccine annually, according to the state of California. She's available to get the COVID vaccine on March 16th, and this individual is um, going to speak to her neurologist and provider, so that's great, but she wanted to know if we had any emerging data talking about vaccine effects in people who are not neurotypical and I am unaware of, of anything and encouraged to see that she's reaching out to her provider but Judy is there anything else you'd like to add to that and I think I would take clues from prior vaccinations right so if you don't if you, if you you know your daughter doesn't respond strongly to the other um, vaccinations that she's been given I would not be super concerned about this one there's nothing about this vaccine that would cause um, an immediate issue with, you know, um, in someone who's um, has already uh, neurodevelopmental issues. But I think it's really important to protect them. And so I, my personal viewpoint on this is protecting them allows them to, to have, you know, the, the social um, interactions, you know, the, to keep up with their sort of their um, ongoing um, programs where I think that isolation from not being able to do that is, is probably worse. So my, what I tell people and people, when people ask me, you know, in general, so, you know, I'm worried about getting it, my own husband, um, I'm worried about getting it, you know, and it's like, do you react to anything else you've ever gotten? Well, no, then it's not likely that you're gonna have a horrendous response to this one either. You know that at least a response that might it isn't safe, and I think we reserve worrying about that for people who are immune compromised, right? That are severely immune compromised because that um, you know that that um, you know negative sort of response to uh, an immune challenge, um, then you know that's when we think about it. Great, thank you, Judy. Um, we'll give uh, just a minute here for any final questions to come in through the question and answer session, but while, oh wait, okay, here they come. I was going to cut in line and ask one of my questions, but let's let's make sure we get through these. Um, what, what is the correlation between mother and child genetic outside environment between gut issues, ADHD, bipolar, uh, what is the more deciding factor? So I think the the heart of the question is gene by environment. Um, so I, you know, I think we've been focusing on uh, immune environmental immune factors. But Judy, perhaps you could comment a little bit on uh, the interaction with genetic predispositions as well. Oh wow, well, I'm not really truly qualified to talk about <laughs> genetics um, because I think I have um, people I work with that are. But um, you know, I think. The, the sort of, we're starting to think less about a diagnosis and more about what are the presenting phenotypes, you know, of an individual or a child and how we handle those versus, you know, sticking a di diagnosis on them. Um, so, you know, what we hope to do is treat, you know, sort of their, their um, different symptomatologies, right? Um, but is is I'm like I was trying to read there there are ways to, to lessen the likelihood of a child developing one if it's more hereditary. Um, you know I, I I don't know to be honest I have I don't think we have any kind of answer for that I'm sorry, um, but at least it's something that we can take into account as we do the work. 
Absolutely. So I, I think, um, you know, there, there are research teams focused on genetic risk factors and others focused on environment. And we're starting to see more collaboration between the two, because as, as Judy pointed out throughout her talk, most women are exposed to viral and bacterial infections at one point or another during pregnancy. And most women who are exposed go on to have children that are not going to be diagnosed with a neurodevelopmental, neurodevelopmental disorder. So we really want to understand that interaction between genes and environment and identify at-risk pregnancies. Um, I'm going to skip to the, the, the third question there, Judy. Um, it's how long after an active COVID infection should a person get the vaccine? Is it age dependent? And I know the CDC has guidelines for that. Three so months. Three months. Days. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that is the, you don't want it before that because you will not enjoy that experience. <laughs> There's also a question uh, related to sex differences. Do you see differences between pregnant women who have female children versus male children with ASD? I ask because I know there are many differences between genders, which is a big reason why fewer females are diagnosed. So um, um, comment on how off the sex of the offspring may interact with these environmental risk factors that we're talking about. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that is actually part of the study that I just described. That's one of our, that is one of our metrics to look at um, because we are not, um, in the past, many of the studies have enrolled, you know, more males than females and, you know, are they, or they've just gone out in the general population and, and um, you know, enrolled what was, you know, the ratio of four to one. I think there is so many, and we've got work going on through the ACE at the MIND Institute, you know, there's so much more going on now to understanding these differences. Um, and we are looking at that in the pregnant women, sort of what this, as I said, sex, it was one of our metrics on the um, offspring. And um, I think one thing that we have learned is how very differently the male and female brains develop. We know that but at the immunologic, the immunologic aspects of how the brain responds. Um, one of my graduate students published a paper a couple years ago on that, and it's so different that it surprised us how strong a factor the sex of the animal was in that um, immune response. So I, I in, and we didn't do any behavior outcome. It was really all about how the brain responded, but the brain responds very actively if you immunize the animal with, you know, something, you know, just anything, right? It just, there is a communication between the periphery and the brain and the brain, male and female brains respond very differently. So knowing that we are actually looking at things quite differently than we used to. And I think it's a super important question. Absolutely. So um, more need uh, for research looking at sex as a biological variable. And I know that several of our large uh, team science projects here at UC Davis Health are actually going to focus on that very question and, and do just what Judy's describing, use our animal models to really drill down and understand the, the different mechanisms um, between male and female offspring brain exposure. Um, I think we are wrapping up our chat room questions. I'm going to ask you one final question then, Judy, and give you uh, time to give any additional additional thoughts or comments, but throughout your talk, um, you emphasized uh, neuroimmunology and talked about how uh, back when I was a grad student or you were a grad student, our immunologists and neuroscientists did not spend a lot of time collaborating and didn't speak the same language. And I would just like to hear your thoughts on future directions for neuroimmunology training and how we can better equip uh, the next generation of scientists to really tackle these difficult questions. I know, and I think that cross-training is key as you and I both have students that are doing that right now right and and I think um, we're trying to more create more formal programs to do this instead of them being trained in neuroscience and then learning immunology being trained in immunology and then learning neuroscience we're trying to integrate that and I think some of what you know I discussed today um, all of this has come up in my during my time as an investigator in in recent years right um, and that privileged brain that we used to think about um, is certainly changing. We know that sleep, for example, good sleep, REM sleep, getting into a nice deep sleep is really important for cleaning your brain. So the lymphatic system that's in the brain is working at night when you're sleeping and that is kind of clearing all the junk out of your brain, not the thoughts, but the actual physical junk out of your brain, right? And so these are, these are things that just came out in the last five years, right? That we really, truly understand this. And I think it's important that our students are, are sort of taught 
this overlap and taught this um, sort of partnership between the immune system and the brain that exists for health and, you know, in disease. I think we've always thought about, oh my God, if there's inflammation in the brain, it's a terrible thing. It's not. It, some of that is repair and some of that is, as I said, sort of cleaning up and, and that has certainly come out in Alzheimer's disease research. But I think um, creating these cross-discipline projects where our students are learning from each other, or, you know, I'm learning from my colleagues. I am not qualified at all to, to really understand the neuroscience and the brain part of this. I mean, I get a little bit because I learn, but um, I cannot do what I do well without my colleagues. And, and it's nice that we're training the next gen of scientists to at least be more, um, you know, um, well read in, in sort of both aspects. And, and more importantly, the integration of those two disciplines as, as both for brain development, but also, as I said, for life, health across the lifespan of your brain. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.